Hi everyone, I'm here at the Natural Dog Conference 2015 and I am chatting to Vince the Vet who is one of our supporters of the conference. Now Vince, you have sponsored today's talk uh, Dr Karen Becker, so we haven't yet um, seen Karen Becker but we're both very excited to watch Karen's talk later. But tell us a little bit about your products and, and sort of how they fit in with the conference. Well Karen and I share um, the a very similar philosophy actually about a completely integrated approach to the care of pets, dogs and cats and that involves combining excellent good healthy balanced nutrition in the form of a raw food diet supplementing that with very special nutrients which supply concentrated health enhancing nutrients not found in ordinary food mm -hmm. and then on top of that we also provide homeopathic and holistic remedies to stimulate the healing. So you've got the foundation of a fabulous nutrition, you've got the second tier of nutrients which stimulate healing and health in various organs of the body, and then on top of that, if necessary, mm -hmm. you can stimulate with specific targeted homeopathic remedies for and specific conditions. These remedies, you do people have to come and see you and have an appointment with you or, or do they buy them from you online? Or the how raw that food work? they can buy from us directly or from certain retailers. The nutritional supplements also from selected retailers and from online. Mm -hmm. And the remedies are prescribed following a holistic or a homeopathic consultation. Right. But I must say we, we provide a lot of free expert advice over the phone, by email and on live chat. Mm -hmm. I spend half my week speaking to people mm. free of charge, advising them on the holistic health of their pets and we, we just love doing that. Yeah. And then the next tier is when pets have specific health problems or their owners want an enhanced level of health that the pet isn't experiencing at that time. Okay, and whereabouts in the UK are you? We're based around Telford, but I actually have clients stretching from Merseyside in the north to Hampshire in the south. I do tend to travel for holistic and homeopathic consultations because seeing a pet and, and the family and the home environment yeah. provides vital yeah. clues as to the remedies that can help stimulate healing in a particular pet mm -hmm. and so important and I, I love going out and meeting people too yeah. but the success rate is far higher even though it's far more time consuming if I actually visit the pets. Yes, I can imagine. Yeah, well, you've got the travel time as well, exactly. Yeah, so yes, yes. What made you as a vet look at different holistic or complementary ways of working with animals? It was frustration, basically. I, uh, ever since I qualified as a vet, I wanted to be the best vet I could possibly be. Yeah. So I studied orthopaedics for three years and, and almost sat the certificate when a practice came up to buy so I bought my own practice because I wanted to develop my own philosophy mm -hmm. and we became a center of excellence in conventional medicine but it, it wasn't enough for me right. there were too many pets that couldn't be helped or the side effects of drugs steroids antibiotics and the like were, were becoming frustrating to me I, I didn't feel as though I was doing the best that was possible mm -hmm. I always had this belief too that the body is capable of extraordinary things with the right key and if, if a disease process is present in the body, mm -hmm. what can we do to return that body to the state of being it was in prior to the onset of the disease? I, didn't, mm -hmm. I don't see disease as a one-way street. Mm -hmm. And so that got me looking at acupuncture, homeopathy, Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. and you feel therapy and all this sort of thing. Yeah. And that's when I first started to study homeopathy and acupuncture. Yeah, well, good for you. Good for you. And there are more vets now that are coming forward and saying, actually, this is the way I want to work. This is, this is better for the animals. Do you want to tell us about your, your Donny just to finish? To oh, Donny, very interesting case actually. Donny was presented um, with kennel cough to his own vet towards the end of last year. He was treated for two or three months and then x-rayed and was found to have a tumour the size of a grapefruit in one lung. Uh, uh, the tumour the size of a tangerine in, the st in this lung. He had multiple lymphomas in his liver and his spleen. I saw him just before he was about to go to Liverpool University to start chemotherapy and he had this dreadful cough. Prescribed the supplements, fighting fit to support his immune system, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to nourish his organs. He also had slick and sleek to provide energy because he was losing weight. And I prescribed him also some homeopathic remedies. The next morning I had a phone call to say that the cough had gone completely, been coughing for four months. Um, we had a very involved chat, it was very interesting actually because the, things aren't black and white. This dog was very ill obviously. So the owner, we talked about 
an entirely holistic route or going down a holistic and conventional route combined. Mm -hmm. The owners decided to go to Liverpool University and I supported them fully in that. All through the chemotherapy we continued the remedies, uh, with the supplements and with various other things, changes in his diet. He had no side effects from the chemotherapy whatsoever. That's good. He was yeah. scanned eight weeks ago and is completely cancer free. Now these are huge masses. Yeah. It was a T lymphoma. The prognosis from Liverpool was that he would live probably a couple of months. Well, we're two months past that, he's on a completely holistic regime and he's running around like a puppy, which is just, I mean, and that's the sort of thing that inspires you to be a holistic vet and to continue doing it no matter how much hard work it is. Yeah, it, well that is pretty amazing. Um, that is also the kind of story that you know you hear as a pet owner when you talk to other dog owners and really why we started doing something like the Natural Dog Conference. So yes, we can share brilliant. these kind of stories and you know there are other ways that people can help their animals. And supplements tend to get bad press. Supplements I think is a wrong word because Supplements are special sort of whole foods and whole food extracts from nature that provide specific health enhancing nutrients that are present in ordinary food. So supplement has this idea that you give it as something separate. But we, we heard from Rodney yesterday about how depleted nutritionally the food is in our food chain. Mm -hmm. We'll hear from Karen later on about how toxic the world is. Our pets are living in a very toxic world compared to the one they've evolved in over the last Definitely. 150 million years. And we're also aware of the overuse of drugs, mm -hmm. steroids and antibiotics. Now all of these place huge demands on the body and predispose to disease. And a good healthy diet is simply the foundation. Our pets need the support, the nutritional support and the health enhancing support of special supplements, special gifts from nature yeah. and the homeopathic triggers because homeopathic preparations release the inner healing triggers that aren't present in physical foods and that combination of three Mir miracles yeah. can occur. The power of three, as Absolutely. they say. Absolutely. <laughs> the, the, the holy trinity. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for talking Pleasure. to us. And I have learned so much over the last two days. Um, I'm just excited to implement everything that I've learned. Thank you to all the sponsors. Um, I was just talking to Nick. Nick and I both knew uh, that we would be holistic doctors. I grew up in a really proactive home, and I knew that I would come out. I grew up with parents. My grandma taught me how to juice wheatgrass, and I grew up with parents that exercised and ate organic, and it was very natural for them to be holistic in the home. So I knew that I would be an integrative practitioner. But most veterinarians, including Vince Savette, uh, we have, uh, starting at this corner of our sponsors all the way around, they are stellar, 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 and stellar. And Vince Devet, um, like many holistic veterinarians, they come out conventional, they become wildly frustrated, and then they end up not having enough tools in their tool bag, so they end up gathering an acupuncture tool, or gathering an herb tool, or gathering a homeopathy tool, anything. And what I have found, that there's kind of two categories of doctors, even those doctors graduating, not realizing that they're ever going to dabble in, in integrative medicine, by nature they are thinkers. They are problem solvers, and most importantly, they want to fix their patient. So what I have found is my colleagues, even the young kids coming out of vet school, I can almost pick them out now. Those kids that graduate, and they're like, you know what? I'm glad for those eight years I went through, but man, I'm doing everything textbook perfect, and I've got patients I can't fix. What are you doing for this? What are you doing for this? And you can see those personality types that are insistent on curing their patient. It's inspiring to us. We love them. Any of you new veterinarians here, any veterinarian here who are, are frustrated in conventional medicine, there's options for you. And so we've got veterinarians that have developed human grade, USDA inspected organic product lines. We have whole food supplements. We have all the way around to the canine rescue organization. If you guys have not visited this entire section, Stellar, we have a rescue group that rescues dogs from around Europe and treats them. It almost brings tears to my eyes. Treats them all integratively, holistically. I mean, awesome, right? Amazing. So, um, inspiring. Every single one of these companies here are ethical. They want to be here. They made decisions to practice uh, medicine or to practice in terms of a company being very different. So um, we're going to spend an hour and 15 minutes together this afternoon and I'm going to talk about, it's a frustrating topic for me. I am going to try and not cry, but the truth of the matter is we're going to talk about how we can keep dogs detox in a fairly toxic world. So I knew I would be a holistic veterinarian. Um, I knew I would come out practicing differently. There are two ways to practice medicine, reactively and proactively. So reactive vets wait till their dogs get sick. That's what I was taught in veterinary medicine. 
You wait till your patients get sick. You wait for you guys to make an appointment. You bring the dog in. We give you some drugs that treat the symptom. We never identify the root cause. And then you'll just reschedule six to eight times a year. In the United States, the average dog goes to the vet six to eight times. Oh, that's appalling to me as a proactive vet. And I, um, I was invited every year but two years to lecture at the graduating class of Oh, I practiced in Chicago, and at the, the, the vet school in Chicago, Chicago, um, uh, Illinois, Urbana, has a vet school, and I'm invited on to talk to the graduating seniors every year but 2002. And let me tell you why I was not invited back in 2002. In 2001, I was there, and I was talking to this beautiful group of 100 new veterinarians, and I said, listen, guys, you have the opportunity you weren't trained this way, but you have the opportunity to quit practicing reactive medicine. So you can actually become a proactive vet, which means you can identify and remove lifestyle obstacles before disease occurs. And you can see they're like, what? <laughs> and then I went on to say, you can actually also, I, I know all we learned about was antibiotic, steroids, antifungal drugs, but let me tell you something. When those don't work, because they won't, you will be less than three months out of medical school and you will say, I did the culture, I prescribed the medication. It didn't work. The infection's supposed to go away. It didn't. Now what do we do? Well, you better have something else to do. So a lot of us end up picking integrative choices because we didn't have those. We didn't have those options. So I was trying to inspire this young group of veterinarians, and the dean of the vet school stood up in the back row and said, Dr. Becker, if you're so busy fixing all your patients up there in Chicago, you'll probably work yourself out of a client base. He said, a sick pet is a lot of revenue. That was so funny. My best girlfriend was there, and she was in the front row. She goes, ooh. <laughs> Those are fighting words for Becca, right? <laughs> I, I am not, um, I am a terrier. I'm, I, have, I am literally, I'm the world's most impatient veterinarian, but I have a lot of love and a lot of patience for people. For the first time in my adult life, I kind of saw the room narrow, and I was like, like I, I did like partial retraction. I was like, <laughs> So I did the whole, Count it out, right? I didn't want to flip out at the veterinary school. And I said, let me tell you something. I have 15,000 active clients. Every single one of them so empowered, so knowledgeable, so up on it that they are paying to come in not once a year, not six or eight times a year for illness. They are paying to come in twice a year for me to keep their dog so healthy that they never become sick. And they are referring all their buddies, all their friends. I do phone consults from around the world. I am so busy that not only will I not work myself out of a practice, I am so busy I'm no longer taking new clients. <laughs> Pardon me while I step behind the curtain and grab water. Um, and last but not least, I'm a wellness veterinarian. So to complete the statement pertaining to integrative veterinary medicine, and really what I tell these young veterinarians is, guys, sometimes, God forbid, if your dog is hit by a bus, you're going to need the right side of the pharmacy, right? You need emergency drugs to control swelling on the brain. And I will tell you, I have my fair share of truly, a lot of people say, you know, Becca, you're not really holistic. And I guess in that aspect, if, I have, if my dog is hit by a car, and if it takes drugs to get the swelling off the brain to save my dog's life, you're damn right, I'm gonna pull them out, save my dog's life. Now, have I been criticized? And what people will say is, it's not holistic. You call it what you want, I'm gonna call it common sense medicine, which is you start with the least toxic options first, homeopathy, herbs, acupuncture, Eastern herbs, Western herbs, Ayurvedic herbs, hands-on healing, prayer, you, I don't, it doesn't matter. If it fixes your patient non-toxically, we're in, right? We're in, we'll take it. We don't need double blind placebo controlled studies, it just works. Now the frustration, and why I love D Dr. Nick so much, is he's in the process of recognizing our colleagues don't respect us and ultimately behind our backs bash us, right? We're, I'm the weird vet. <laughs> but people like him, trailblazers, are in the process of creating credentialed double blind pl placebo controlled studies about raw and fresh foods. Because who's funding those studies now? Purina, Science, Sat, Yukonuba. They've got millions of dollars to fund the studies that they can say, kibble is better. Well, you and I both know that's not true. Who's got the million bucks laying around to prove it? We're in the process of accumulating professionals with groups like he's just created to do the studies to begin turning the tables. Hallelujah, R applause right there. So as a proactive, integrative veterinarian, what do I do? I partner with clients to help them pick the best lifestyle choices that they can to, uh, even though the clock is ticking and bodies are getting older. I was taught in vet school, here's what's gonna happen. Rodney said it, dog's gonna live to about 12, 
At about eight, we're supposed to call them seniors. That kills me, right, professionally, call them a senior. That's, I mean, you know, I'm going on 45. That's like, you know, you're kind of midlife. Your body's going to break. You're going to get fat, get, have triglyceride problems, have cholesterol, have diabetes, get cancer and die, right? That's what they're trying to tell me from here on out. That sucks. <laughs> I don't want that to be my life. But that's also what we're trying to tell you in reactive veterinary medicine, right? Senior dogs at eight, they're going to get fat. They're probably going to get the big one out of two cancer. But this is what we know to be true. We have 95% control over that not happening through wise lifestyle choices. So I'm going to cover with you today the basic lifestyle choices and the detox options that I'm going to suggest to you to help your dog not become a statistic. And truly, most, how many people in here have cats? Okay, so sometimes you're gonna hear me say cats, and it's so funny. You guys know this, when you don't mention cats, all my cat people are like, you didn't include cats. In fact, it's so funny, I, did you guys see some of the comments on the website for the Natural Dog Conference? When's there gonna be a cat conference? <laughs> I love my cat people because they keep it real, and they don't take anything from anyone. So, if you're in a cat conference, you say the D word, they're like, ooh, this is not a dog conference. <laughs> all right, so if I say cats, it'll be applicable for cats, because some of you have cats, but Sometimes we throw the C word out there and we're just gonna let it go. So at my client, I mean at my practice, I schedule half an hour appointments and one hour appointments. And I do that because even though I talk super fast, every single one of my exams, I cover all three of these pillars of health. Dr. Thompson just said, he calls it holism. It's a beautiful way to break it down. Because I um, am wildly impatient and because I have a lot of information to cover and because I am a little bit of a perfectionist, I cover each and every one of these pill pillars at each and every exam. From If you come in for the six-week-old puppy, we'll talk about it, and we will cover each one of these things at every exam until the day your dog transitions. So the first pillar of health is species-appropriate nutrition, kind of common sense. The second pillar of health is a balanced immune system, and the third pillar of health is resilient frame and organ systems. And there's no one pillar more important than another. So we cover each and every one of them. Keep in mind that the art of medicine is matching a protocol, a dynamically changing health protocol to where the body's at. So if you bring me a vibrantly strong, well-bred puppy, that's a whole different protocol than a rescued puppy that has mange, probably was exposed to a bunch of disease processes, loaded with GI parasites, and gave him an abusive, unsocialized background. Totally different protocols. And when you bring me that dog at a year and a half of age and say, hey, we're into agility, awesome totally different protocol than a four and a half year old dog that has lived a sedentary life and the mama says, we're gonna start nose work. Awesome, totally different protocols. To my nine year old dogs that maybe have been on unbalanced food for six or seven years, totally different protocol. To my senior dogs at 12, starting to get stiff, totally different protocol. To my geriatric dogs, love of my life. If I, if I was not a veterinarian, I'd be a botanist. If I was not a botanist, I would take care of old people. I love old life magical to me. And so those geriatric protocols are incredibly different. So if you have a veterinarian that's cookie cutter, you just, just stay on the same thing, just keep giving it, just keep giving it, that's not a proactive veterinarian in my opinion. So the art of medicine is to match a beautiful protocol for mind, body, spirit, immune system, uh, frame, and nutrition to where your patient's at. And um, that's the goal for me in terms of bringing my professional along for all of us to be in terms of proactive veterinary care. This is one of my exam rooms. You'll notice no tables. Now, those of you that are women know that we don't really like to be on stainless steel tables and I took that to the extreme. No one likes to be on stainless steel tables and so all of my patients are on the ground on a beautiful organic rug. I do have this little, I do have this little cart here and I will put a towel on it for kitties um, that don't want to be on the ground but all that I do most of my exams on the floor. So your question's gonna be, well, if you're a wellness veterinarian, why are you seeing sick dogs? And guys, I see the bottom of the barrel dogs. Now, part of this is, uh, even though I'm not accepting new clients, the clients that have been with me for the last 19 years, if they bring in puppies, the client is in. And so as their older pets die, we bring in puppies. I'm still seeing my clients, but I'm not taking on new people. So I'm still seeing puppies and rescues and new animals. And it is frustrating because I'm on, on sometimes third generation of people modifying the vaccine schedule, feeding fresh, whole living foods, giving their, making sure that their dog's BMI, that their body mass index is correct, making sure that as they're aging, they're not atrophying. So how many of you know you can be thin but under-muscled, right? So I have a lot of dogs that people say, no, my dog's weight is the same. That's cool, but your dog is shrinking in terms of muscle mass by the day. We're no further ahead, right? When old animals slip on a rug and tear their ACL, we've not done our job in fortifying 
tendons, ligaments, making sure core tone is right, making sure that on a force plate, your, your quad and glute muscles are balanced, right? As animals age, they go through compensatory changes. Who's looking out for that? Who's analyzing that? Proactive veterinarians need to be, and they are. Frustratingly, all of you are saying, I don't have access to a proactive vet. It's coming. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, right? All right? <laughs> it's coming. But the question is, why do you see sick animals? Well, here's my theory. Nutritional deficiencies blended with our toxic earth and some crappy genetics over the last 100 years, and it could make a lethal combination. So we're going to go through and break down each one of these potentials, and then, of course, most importantly, what we can do about it. So sadly, I'm not going to do all doom and gloom, but some of you were not here yesterday to hear Rodney talk about a depleted earth. And the truth of the matter is, guys, we have earth now. In fact, over the last 40 years, over, over 1.5 billion hectares of sterile soil. That is land that cannot grow anything. It's sterile. That should be really concerning for you. As the earth is dying, before we get to this point, nutrient values become less and less in soil and less and less in the foods that come out of that soil. So what is soil depletion? It's a substantial decline in the nutrients found in the dirt that grows our food. And the end result is we have nutrient deficient plants, which means we have nutrient deficient foods, and then people and animals that eat those plants also end up nutrient deficient. This is due to two factors and two factors only. Non-sustainable farming practices, we are no longer farming like we were 200 years ago, and um, modern intensive agribusiness that involves farming with a P, or pharmacy slash drugs that we're putting, drugs and toxins that we're putting on the earth, versus the way our ancestors farmed 200 years ago. So to break that down, and sadly, the only reason I'm bringing this out is if you haven't recognized this is going on, you need to not only apply it to your own nutritional well-being, but obviously the animals you're caring for as well. The earth is in chemical overload. In fact, GM crops require a higher level of the herbicide glyphosate. Now, glyphosate is produced from a company called Monsanto. And here's the frustration with Monsanto, guys. Monsanto, God bless America for messing up almost everything. Okay, I love my country, but we do a great job of messing up almost everything. Monsanto, the company that produces Roundup, or glyphosate, are now more powerful than our country's FDA, Food and Drug Administration. And when you have a private business that is more powerful than the regulatory body that approves chemicals, we have a conflict of interest, and we have a conflict of interest. So in addition to Monsanto basically dictating to our government what will pass and why, we have 40, over, 40, or over 440 million crops that are genetically modified. As of last year, more coming. Monsanto is also responsible for the 1.2 billion pounds of chemicals that are spread on crops. And frustratingly, we know that those chemicals cause cancer. We know it to be true. More upsetting is that weeds, just like bacteria become resistant to antibiotics, weeds are becoming resistant to glyphosate. So what's Monsanto doing? They are making the next generation, released in 2017, of more genetically modified crops that will be more resistant to more chemicals. So the situation is just becoming worse. Well, you look at that and you think, oh my gosh, what does that mean? Well, what that means is, when it comes to dogs and cats and our bodies, here's what you have to know. This is not an agribusiness lecture, but every single one of our bodies has glyphosate in it. It doesn't matter if you're in a green home. It doesn't matter if you eat all organic. Every single one of us right now have measurable amounts of glyphosate in our bodies. And guess what? Our dog's bodies are worse. So we know it's in us. The question is, what is it doing? Well, frustratingly, glyphosate's immobilized nutrients absorption in plants. That's how it allows weeds to die. Now, I'm not anyone in here a microbiologist. I'm not, so pardon me if I paraphrase this shortly. The shikimati pathway is how glyphosate does its damage. And in this pathway, animals don't have this biochemical reaction in their bodies, but bacteria do. So bacteria are very sensitive to Roundup and glyphosate. Now, here's the kicker. Your dog's body, their healthy bacteria outnumber their body cells 10 to 1. There are more bacteria in your dog's gut than there is all, in terms of number of cells in his entire body from the tip of his nose to the tip of his tail. 
So what does that mean in terms of glyphosate? What it means is glyphosates preferentially attack your dog's GI tract, and they don't take out the negative guys. They don't take out the potentially pathogenic bacteria. They don't take out the funguses, and, you know, the potential fungi or candida overgrowth. They're not taking out the bad guys. They knock out the probiotics, the good, healthy, positive bacteria that your dog needs for nutrient assimilation, for, for balanced immunologic health. They knock out the good guys. So what does that mean? That means that every dog that has had exposure to glyphosate has a component of dysbiosis going on in their gut. Now, this is, a lot of people say, oh my gosh. Now, what I will tell you, when I went to vet school 20 years ago, they discussed the theory of dysbiosis. It's also called leaky gut. Now, I'm very proud to say that it's taught as bona fide science in all veterinary schools in the U.S. It's no longer the leaky gut theory. It is the leaky, it, it's leaky gut. It's dysbiosis. So what happens when dogs and humans have leaky gut? Well, there are these cells in the small intestine called tight junctions. And, if you, and dogs are interesting because dogs lick their butt, they eat poo, they eat rocks, sticks, dead things, right? Dogs are scavenging carnivores. They put whatever in their mouth. If humans behave that way, we would probably die. But dogs have this amazing acidic stomach, a very short GI tract. They have really strong, healthy bacteria that really, inside of this war between the good guys and the bad guys inside of your dog's gut, the good guys will win as long as you keep the playing field fairly level. Glyphosate doesn't allow that to happen. So the tight junctions in the small intestine swell up. And this term, leaky gut, is the end result. So innate GI defenses are gone. The most frustrating part as a veterinarian is this can happen, in fact, oftentimes as young as eight weeks. Puppies are naturally born with open tight junctions. That's how colostrum gets in. In theory, the small intestine is supposed to close the tight junction seal, and then the gut becomes the semi-permeable mem membrane that allows the nutrients and keeps out poo, rock sticks, all the crap the puppies put in your mouth. The GI tract says, bring it in, because we got this. We can discern good from bad, nutrient from allergen, we got it. But what if that process doesn't happen? The gut becomes open, your dog goes outside, rolls around in the grass, and ragweeds, grasses, pollens, molds right into the GI tract. You've heard you should rotate your dog's diet, right? So you feed chicken, beef, bison, antelope, elk, rabbit, goat, quail, fish, all that's great, unless your dog has leaky gut because your dog's GI tract will partially break down those proteins, and those proteins are shuttled, partially digested directly into the bloodstream, and your dog's immune system does exactly what it was designed to do. Those antigens come in, and your dog's directly into the bloodstream, and your dog's body says, what is this huge molecule doing in my bloodstream? I'm going to mount an antigen antibody attack. I'm going to make antibodies to every single one of those foods. I'm going to make antigens antigens to ragweeds, grasses, pollens, molds, and by four years of age, what do we have in this world? We have an allergy epidemic. Epidemic. Number one reason dogs go to the veterinarian in modernized countries, allergens. Not to mention, you have massive inflammation, and those of you that know about inflammation know chronic inflammation is the number one reason that degeneration occurs in the body. It's been linked to cancer, autoimmune disease, everything that has an itis, otitis, dermatitis, gingivitis, right? Every itis you hear is inflammation in the body and it is rampant in veterinary medicine. So we have a massive inflammatory problem, not to mention raging IBD, IBS, sensitive tummies, whatever you want to call it, we got, we got it. And we got a lot of it in veterinary medicine. So this is what I see in practice. This is Dr. Dodd's amazing saliva, uh, saliva test that really discerns food sensitivities. And I have literally thousands of dogs that are, that are allergic. And we get when we get test results back, what this shows is that normal is less than 10 here. And when we have dogs that are allergic to every single thing they have ever eaten, you should all ask yourselves, how is that possible? How can a dog be allergic to every single thing I put in my dog's mouth? What is going on? You have a dog that has leaky gut. You have a dog that has dysbiosis, and it's a major problem. But even worse, I wish we were done with the glyphosate issue. It gets worse. They have not been proven safe. Long-term health studies have never been conducted. It absolutely has been linked to not just allergies, but organ failure. Animal studies actually show kidney and liver disease at the 90-day feeding trial. It just goes from bad to worse. 
So when you start connecting the dots, absolutely, dysbiosis, this leaky gut situation, at best, you absorb allergens. At worst, you're shuttling every environmental pollutant directly into your dog's bloodstream, including heavy metals. Now, here's the kicker with heavy metals. Heavy metals cross the blood-brain barrier, but your dog's central nervous system doesn't have a liver, right? So all the heavy metals get into their body, and if it stays in systemic bloodstream, our God-blessed liver just stores it up. But if it doesn't stay in our systemic bloodstream and it crosses the blood-brain barrier, we have dogs that have heavy metals in their brains and all sorts of undi all those veterinarians out there with that C, head tilt, peripheral neuropathy, we don't even know if it's, just, it, we don't know what kind of neuropathy. When veterinarians see all sorts of weird, twitchy dogs that are doing odd things, we're like, oh, it has neuropathy. What does that mean? What does it mean? We need to begin thinking about tox central nervous system toxicosis as an ultimate root cause for all of this epidemic of central nervous system diseases that we have yet to label. We know that glyphosate disrupts the cytochrome P450 path pathway, and that's a really fancy word for the liver's ability to detoxify itself. So detoxification can occur. We know in humans, glyphosate accumulation has been linked to autism, depression, dementia, anxiety, and Parkinson's. Now, we don't recognize any of these syndromes of veterinary medicine. We really don't. At best, we recognize anxiety. Number one reason, dogs are dumped at pounds, right? Crazy, untrainable, autism, untrainable. Depression, your dog just lays around all day. Dementia, we can call it canine cognitive disorder. But a lot of dogs at four and five are starting to space off. Head press, stand in a corner. They're not performing as well in the ring. You're starting to lose a connection. They sit under the bed. Weird things happening neurologically. Autoimmune disease at best, which means when your immune system is so confused, the first step in immune system reactivity is the definition of an allergy, an overimmune response. But worst case scenario is one step beyond a hyperactive immune system, and you have a body that's so confused, it attacks itself. The definition of autoimmune disease. So, to summarize, we have a leaky gut that is massively inflamed. Nutrient malabsorption absolutely happens because no nutrients can get across the small intestine wall. We have an immune system reaction at best causes GI problems, food intolerances and allergies, but at worst uh, autoimmune disease and most certainly cancer. So the, so the frustrating sum of the problem, we have toxic and nutrient deficient roots which equals nutrient deficient plants, which ultimately equals nutrient deficient animals. That's you and the dogs that you feed. So in addition, our dogs have actually a bigger issue to this toxic planet. And I'm gonna challenge you to be thinking that actually dogs actually, Rodney pointed out and, and Nick pointed out as well, dogs are the species that's most riddled with cancer. And I'm gonna show you how and why. We have a food crisis we have toxins in our home that we have yet to address, and God blessed my colleagues, my conventional colleagues, doing what they think is best, adding fuel to the fire. So, those of you that um, get my newsletter, I write, uh, I write, actually I write seven blogs on Saturday, and then two weeks before, and then we, I don't release, my beautiful little helper elf, her name is Daryl, she releases one a day, and it was so funny, when we were, when I, when we were in Australia, Fivo said, I wake up every morning with Dr. Becca, and it's kind of sounded a little cheesy and creepy, but all that to say, I, get a, I send out a free newsletter, and in that free newsletter, you're going to see over and over and over, my gosh, she bashes kibble. And guys, I'm the first one to say, I have a whole four-hour lecture series on best to worst foods, and what I will tell you is, if you're feeding kibble, and that's the only thing you can afford to feed, you are off the hook. You're off the hook. But if you can afford to feed better and do better, do it. I'm gonna do 30 seconds on actually the reasons why I hate kibble because it's probably honestly, when we're all done, we're gonna do a little test. I wanna know how many of you have ever heard this. Um, we did hear you guys were super advanced and we love advanced audiences, so you're probably like, I already got this, this is a waste of 90 seconds. So I'm gonna go fast. The big question is, why are you such a kibble hater? And my answer is advanced glycation end products. That's why I hate kibble. So what's an advanced glycation end products? Well, when you heat food, any food, to above 300 degrees, a very toxic reaction between protein and sugar occurs. This toxic reaction, forms a byproduct called advanced glycation end products. And when you consume advanced glycation end products, DNA damages occur. And actually, the extrusion process, which is how 95% of kibble is produced, results in the highest level of advanced glycation end products ever known on the planet. 
So why are we ignoring this topic? We know that there's over 8,000 studies demonstrating that when you consume them, they're highly toxic. We know that my studies confirm that you will have heart, kidney, liver disease, diabetes, and delayed wound healing. And we know that the remedy to advance glycation end products is fresh food. No one's talking about this. Of course not. If the kibble industry would say, oh, by the way, every bite of processed food you're feeding, processed meaning kibble, every bite of extruded kibble that you're feeding, you are shortening your dog's life and reducing your dog's ability to have a functional full vitality for a long period of time. Who wants, who, who wants that release, right? Even more frustrating, two carcinogenic byproducts from the extrusion process happens during extrusion, in addition to advanced glycation end products. When you heat protein to very high temperatures, heterocyclic amines are the end result. And when you heat starch, and remember, even grain-free dry food, you have to have a starch. It could be tapioca, it may be potato, it could be pea, but there's going to be a starch. That's how extruded fruit happens. So even grain-free food, you're still getting it. Every bite of extruded food, you are feeding a small amount of carcinogens to your dogs. That's why I hate dry food. So I had the pleasure and the honor of speaking with Dr. Robert Tereski. He's the head of the EPA in New York. He discovered this by accident. He's in his fancy lab. He's a $100,000 piece of equipment. He's on a Saturday. He's got two Bernese Mountain Dogs. He had two extra cells to run the test for hydrocyclic amine, so he clipped his, his burner's hair, put it in the machine, test results 140 times the legal limit of heterocyclic amines. And he's like, oh my gosh, where did that come from? So he started checking dog foods, right? He wrote two articles, 19 out of 20 dog foods he tested, toxic levels of both of these substances. So when I interviewed him, I'm like, hey, listen, number one, I'm so glad Prina hasn't knocked you off yet. I said, you published this data, you honest to God, you could fear for your life. And he said, I know that. He said, I will tell you this, they buried the data. They, they, they've paid him to not talk. So I don't have a fancy schmancy piece of $100,000 $100, uh, you know, equipment to be able to do this, but these are the types of studies that brilliant, passionate groups of people like Nick Thompson, round of applause for Nick Thompson. No pressure, Nick, wherever you are, no pressure. Um, but these are the studies that we're going to begin introducing to help people get it. So it's not that we're, it's not that dry food's inorganic, overprocessed, dead, and sterile. I mean, <laughs> that's a problem, but more of a problem. Think of it like going through the McDonald's, like the dollar lane for your kids. You can do that. You guys, you can be kibble now and then. You can eat from the dollar menu. Fine. You don't do, you don't drive through the dollar menu for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for your kid for his whole life. Dumb. Feeding dry food, unless you're, unless you're broke. Dumb. The only group of health and wellness professionals on the face of the planet that says eat more processed food and fresh food could be toxic? Veterinarians, right? Oh, fresh food. It's kind of a new age movement. It could be toxic. Are you crazy? I'm embarrassed for my own colleagues. We'll just move along. I'm just embarrassed. So I do have some ethical issues with the pet food industry. We'll zip through them quickly because you're all on the same page. Number one ethical issue, serious quality control issues. We'll just say melamine and leave it at that. People find screws, hair, foreign object, heavy metals, crazy levels of toxic vitamins when they're tested. Additionally, if you are feeding corn, wheat, rice, and any of the bags of food, you have a potential mycotoxin issue. Absolutely questionable raw materials. I am a licensed meat inspector. There is a difference between food grade, which means in parenthesis, human grade, and feed grade, in parenthesis, rendered. Oh wait, I didn't do the quiz. Okay, here's the quiz. How many of you have heard of advanced glycation end products before today? Oh, I'm so, yeah, see, that's good. How many of you just learned something about why we hate kibble even more? Yay, <laughs> okay. So, um, food grade, human grade, less than 2% of the pet foods on the market are human grade. So feed grade, rendered, do I have to say what rendered is? Everyone knows, right? Skip along, right? Nasty, gross pieces and parts. We have quality control issues. And the truth of the matter is, can dogs eat spleens? Yeah. Can dogs eat kidneys? Absolutely. Liver? Absolutely. Those are rendered. Those are great pieces and parts. But the problem is this. As Rodney pointed out, 50% of the carcasses we slaughter have to go somewhere. They go into pet food. So if you're going to feed your dog shoe leather for his entire life, that is not a bio-assimilatable healthy protein. We'll just leave it at that. We've got serious raw material issues. There is a big difference, guys, between happy, healthy meats. And I'll leave it at this. Animals that have a good life move their bodies, eat healthy food, get outside, have a low level of cortisol, and die, die and then die instantly to become food. Those meats are healthier. 
that animals that have a crappy life, where slaughter is actually their salvation, the best day of those animals' life that live in that pit of hell of factory farming, the best day of their life is slaughter, because it's finally done. And what we're learning is when you are feeding those toxic meats for a lifetime of carnivores, carnivorous bodies become toxic. In addition, to have the dry food or canned food go three years, you gotta put something in it. Many of the preservatives are toxic. We have synthetic nutrients. My two pet peeves are the, the synthetic forms of vitamin K and, uh, and selenium. Both of those not approved in the human food industry, but used in pet foods. Obviously, there's not, dogs don't have a GMO pesticide or herbicide requirement. They're still in every bag of food most of the time. And as I just pointed out, you can have an amazing, all organic, human grade label, and guess what? Still nutrient deficient. Frustrating. Another big issue, Rodney touched on this yesterday, and myself and my nutritionist, Steve Brown, we are sticklers about this. AFCO, the American Association of Feed Control Officials, set the bare minimum level of nutrients that dogs need to sustain life for six months. The minimum nutrients. Sometimes they have maximums, but sometimes not. There's no maximum on copper. So you can put 10 times in the legal limit of copper or 50 times for dogs. And if you have a dog with copper storage disease or a predisposition like a Bedlington Terrier, concerning that your processed food, that your AFCO approved food could have toxic levels of copper should be concerning for you. My big frustration is that we use the ancestral diet database as the gold standard. And do you know that the majority of home prep diets that we analyze, they don't even meet AFCO. And AFCO is frightening with their minimums. But when we analyze homemade diets, most of the diets out there don't even meet AFCO, much less the gold standard of the ancestral diet. So we have a long way to go with educating people on how to do homemade diets right. And needless to say, the less you process food, the better. Low heat is not a problem. So I've got clients that say, hey, listen, my HIV positive brother lives with me. We're not doing raw. Fine. Gently cooked is fine. It's still fresh. Gently cook it. Totally fine. I have people say, listen, I can do home prep and I'm following a nutritionally balanced diet that I know in my heart is correct, but I can only do it every three months. I read your article, Dr. Becker, that thiamine's gone in three months and now I'm paranoid that I just made a batch of food and I have to freeze it for three months. Let me tell you this. You making food and freezing it for three months is still hands down better than you buying anything from the store that's sitting a whole lot longer than that. So I will tell you guys, let yourself off the hook wherever you are. I want you to be gentle to yourself through this. And I'm gonna give you a little pep talk and a little swift kick in the ass on the way out about how we're going to be kind to ourselves, but we're also gonna be kind to everyone else in the room with wherever they're at along their evolutionary process. If you open up a dialogue with the people around the table, let me tell you, oftentimes, and Ronnie mentioned this yesterday, nutrition, pet nutrition is a highly debatable topic. And you'll have people that will die, die for what they believe, start arguments, stop off, never talk, say terrible things on Facebook, start a group against you. It's unbelievable that in this tiny 4%, everyone in here light years ahead, it breaks my heart that we can't come together and even love each other regardless of, you know, you're doing synthetic, you're doing synthetic minerals and you're doing veg and you do too much bone. Let's just let it go. <laughs> We're still on the front wave of doing the blessed best we can. And guys, we are light years ahead of the 96% that we know is doing it wrong. So that being said, here's your pep talk. What's necessary for scavenging carnivores? quality sources of bioassimilatable protein, fats, and roughage, organic sources of trace minerals, vitamins, and fatty acids, unadulterated whole fresh foods, moisture, and it needs to be balanced minimum to AFCO, but good Lord, make the ancestral diet your gold standard. What's unnecessary for a scavenging carnivore's body? They do not need carbohydrates. They don't need filler, artificial anything. They don't need synthetics. They don't need GMOs, and they don't need extrusion. Now, I, see, I think the biggest thing I see is people address food, but we forget about water. And 70% of your dog is water. So I will tell you that there are, if you live in a modernized society, chances are one of two toxic chemicals is being automatically added to your public water supply. The first one is chlorine. 93% increase in people who drink chlorinated water. The tests have not been done for dogs, but people, we're mammals. The second concerning and very toxic chemical is fluoride. 
And what's interesting is the whole reason Dr. Carton said fluoridation is the greatest case of fraud in this century is for a multitude of reasons. But remember this, the source of fluoride being added to the majority of public water supplies is a byproduct of the phosphate fertilizer industry. It is highly toxic. The Hawley's Chemical Handbook says toxic if consumed. And these countries, get it? They have banned fluoridation. Notice my country's not on the list. Now, what I did learn about your country is that there are municipalities that have said no fluoride and chlorine. Move there or do what I do and filter your water. So if all you can afford is the desktop $20, give each other that for Christmas. Give it to yourself for Christmas. Right? We just talked about being kind. Be kind to yourself. Buy yourself a countertop filter. If you can swing the 300 bucks, get the under the kitchen counter water filter. If you can swing the whole house filtration so you're bathing in toxin-free water, even better. But filter the majority of the drinking water for yourselves and filter it for your dogs. Then think about how green your house is. Now, when I talk about green homes, I, I'm going to tell you all the pitfalls I made. Guys, I would have told you for the last 15 years, I live in an entirely organic, chemical-free home. But let me tell you some of the places I failed. I would never feed out of plastic food and water bowls, ever. Plastic food and water bowls contain two toxic substances, BHA and phthalates. Both are known endocrine disruptors. They mess with your dog's endocrine system. Think thyroid, adrenal. I would never feed out of plastic, as I'm drinking out of plastic. So good! Someone's got to take a picture. It's so good. Be kind to each other. Be kind to those around you. So funny. So it, I love it how the universe will humble you every time. Don't drink out of plastic. So classic. Oh, but I was going to tell you where I failed. I failed with plastics every year for Christmas. I'm such a cheese ball. You know, we get stockings for the dogs. I go to Petco, PetSmart. There's like big box stores in the U.S., by like 50 to 100 bucks of those really cheesy, like chickens that like squeak. I've got pit bulls. So literally, these are 15 second toys. The girls are like, oh, they, they know, they're old. They, it's happened every Christmas up until two years ago. Every Christmas, they're like, oh, there's my stocking. They wait. So Christmas morning, they're like, here you go. And they, you know, they squeak it like seven, like, yang, 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 squeak, squeak it, rip the squeaker out, onto the next one. Yang, 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 squeak it, rip the squeaker out. And so it's like, boom, boom, boom. Four minutes, you know, 100 bucks of toys destroyed. The heart, the squeaker hearts are ripped out, and the girls are like, yes. And Violet's like, I did it in two minutes, and Ada's like, I did it in 47 seconds. So we have the squeaker rip up at the Christmas morning at my house. Then one of my BFFs, Ted Kirasoti, New York Times, multiple New York Times bestselling author, does a ton of research, says to me, I sent those made in China toys in. You know what you're putting in your dog's mouth? I'll send you the report. Oh, oh my gosh. And then he sent me the report, the report on tennis balls. Oh. So... I have fallen victim to phthalates in my dogs. Thank God they're old and they don't have endocrine issues, but I stopped giving them the toys from China. EMFs. Let me back up to that one. Electromagnetic fields. I didn't know anything about EMFs. I have a house in the middle of the woods. It's grounded out. The whole house is grounded. Energy efficient, beautiful. Um, I got a Gauss meter for Christmas two years ago. Who knows what a Gauss meter is? Measures EMFs? Okay, I didn't know either. You gotta love Joe Mercola. So I'm at the Christmas party. Dr. Mercola says, Karen, I'd like to give you a gift of improving your health. I said, well, of course you would, Dr. Mercola. He says, I'm gonna give you a Gauss meter. It's like a thousand dollar thing, right? You go around your house and it will tell you how much electromagnetic fields are coming off the stuff in your home. So everyone says your fridge is the worst. My fridge was really bad, like toxic levels of EMFs. But I like wine. I have a wine fridge in my kitchen. It was like I was like, oh my gosh. And the worst part is out of the bottom of the wine fridge, there's like a little vent and hot air comes out. Where do my cats all hang out? They are in toxic red zone in front of my wife. I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel terrible. So he helped me. We, we did a bunch of media, remediation. We fixed my EMF problem in my house. But I, I, I didn't even think about that. Now, I will tell you this. Over here in a booth, we have um, someone offering a means of remediating EMFs. You can put it on your dog or cat's collar. Brilliant. Really brilliant. I didn't think about it, but living in that toxic environment will over time cause disruption in a balanced homeostatic body. Synthetic room sprays make sense because anything under your kitchen sink that says call poison control, get it out of your house. Um, switch to vinegar, use natural cleaning solutions, use organic cleaning supplies. 
Yard chemicals, huge problems. We'll touch on that in just a minute. And then obviously off-gassing of smoke, air, and mold. Toxic mold is a big problem. So if you think you have a mold issue, you can do a $25 test and find out if you have mold in your house. You need to get rid of the mold in your home. It's well known to cause organ failure and cancer, not just for you, but for everything living in it. And dog beds. Polybrominated diphenyl ethers, the fancy words for flame retardants. Unless it says organic dog bed, your dog beds have been sprayed with flame retardants, well known to cause endocrine problems. So the best gift you can give your dogs for Christmas, now if you're like me, um, I can't afford organic couches. I buy those disposable couches for like 200 bucks and once you have a bonfire because my, my cat scratch them, my dogs puke on them. I have one intact um, before I knew better. I spayed and neutered all my dogs and ruined them, but I rescued one little wiener dog two years ago. He's intact, he humps the living crap out of my couch. I don't want to talk about what it looks like. I do use organic sheets and cover it and wash them, but my couches are ruined in tears. I buy cheap couches and throw them out. I do cover my toxic couches that have been sprayed with flame retardants with organic coverings because my dogs are naked and fuzzy. My cats lay right on there, and what do they do? They lick themselves. So dogs and cats have the highest level of flame retardants in their bloodstream because they lick them, they eat them. Cover up toxic furnishings and give your dogs the gift of organic dog beds. Now outside. Dogs are fuzzy. In fact, they're like little naked fuzzy swippers. The only place dogs sweat from is the bottom of their feet and their nose. So when they're outside, they can't read the sign that with a little stolen crossbones that says, pesticides just applied, stay off. Dogs can't read that. Dogs walk through those little flags. They eat the little flags. They roll on them. They have exposure that we are in charge of remediating. So if you live in a condo and they are spraying your yard, the common sense thing is you put your dog in a leash, you keep him on the sidewalk, and you go to a non-toxic place to have him exercise. You don't let your dog eat freshly sprayed grass. Common sense things to help reduce the exposure. If your dog has exposure that you didn't count on, I also have a license in Arizona. Everyone in Arizona has a pool. The pool man comes once a week, dumps toxic levels of chlorine in the pool, says to the family, don't go in the pool 24 hours. The dog... My clients call, what do I do? He jumped in yesterday and the guy said it was really toxic. Get your dog out and wash him off. The Association of Veterinary and Dermatologists says we can reduce environmental toxins by 50, 50 or 50% by irrigation therapy. Irrigation therapy is the fancy word for rinsing your dog off. <laughs> so scientific, I bet it was a million dollars to find out to find that out. So if you have a dog that you has exposure that you can't get rid of, if you live in an apartment that they're coming in spraying, take showers a lot, you guys, you don't have to use chemicals. Rinse your body off, hose your dog off. Rinse the chemicals off animals that are accumulating toxins. 80,000 synthetic chemicals surround you and your pet every day. Coming in from every imaginable surface and our cells and our dog cells interacting with about 200 known industrial chemicals every day. The situation is worth for animals because they can't read. And we have our blessed conventional veterinarians. Now, I am not, I'm not generally bashing my profession, but we have a long way to go. And I believe the majority of conventional veterinarians have, for whatever reason, lost a component of common sense. Gone. When we start recommending indoor house cats get flea and tick medications every month, and heartworm prevention, even though the spe they're not even a natural species for a heartworm, they're not, they're not the correct host. I believe we have lost our mar marbles, right? Put flea and tick chemicals on an indoor house cat and give them heartworm? Are you kidding me? Why aren't clients saying, are you kidding me? So I want to give you permission today to say to your veterinarian, are you kidding me? <laughs> because you need to begin gently and lovingly challenging things that don't make sense in your brain. We have the ability, as proactive, empowered pet guardians, to say to our vet, I know that a well-timed parvo distemper adenovirus, not to mention parainfluenza chronolepto bordetella, I know that the three core vaccines correctly given to my dog once at 16 weeks of age, I know the research shows they are protected for life. I am not interested in giving my dog a parvo distemper adenovirus, parainfluenza, lepto, coronaline, bordetella, and rabies at 6, 8, 10, 12 weeks, because I bought the puppy package, and then at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 years, until they die, the same dose for the 10-pound teacup as we do for the 250-pound St. Bernard, asinine. You have a right to ask questions like, I don't think I'm going to do that, or I'd like to do a titer, a blood test that measures previous immunity. I, I would like to do that. 
Now, some of you are saying it sounds really great. You may end up firing your vet. You may end up a la carte your vet, which is, you know what? My grandma, great grandma, everyone went to Dr. Jones. I don't want to offend him. So I'm going to go to maybe a conventional vet that will honor me and do this. And I'm going to go to Dr. Jones for things that he's not going to put in my duck. You can drop poo off at Dr. Jones. You can drop pee off at Dr. Jones. You can go to Dr. Jones for things that come out of your dog, but if you're going to inject anything into your dog, you better darn well align yourself with a veterinarian who you know lines up with your personal ethical viewpoints on medicine and health. You have a right to detox your dogs from vaccines. You have a right to say to your doctor, why am I giving this prescription? And is there something safer, natural, or cheaper that I could be doing, common sense, at-home things? What do you got for me that's not 56 bucks? You have the right to say that. You have a right to say, I live in Nova Scotia, the pit of Arctic tundra, <laughs> where it's below zero nine months out of, actually, 10 and a half months, the one day it was warm, I was there, it got up to 40. Um, we know that for the microfilaria to move to the mouth part of the mosquito, it has to be 69 degrees for three weeks. Why, if you're living in the pit of the frozen Arctic tundra, are you doing heart prevention year-round, Rodney? No, Rodney isn't. But you have a right to determine what your infective season is. In Chicago, it's three heart pills spaced six weeks apart with some milk thistle after to make sure the liver's flushing it out, we're done. What does every other conventional veterinarian in Chicago recommend? Year-round heartworm every month, starting at six weeks until the day the dog dies. What do proactive vets recommend? Find out when it's gonna be 69 degrees for three weeks or more. Give a heart and pill then, count six weeks out. If it's still that warm, give it again. Chicago can be the pit of hell. And sometimes we can get by giving two heart and preventions, with, which is 10 doses of insecticide that we have avoided through common sense, smart, empowered thinking. That's exactly what I want you to start doing. And you have a right to coordinate a detox protocol. So if you live in an apartment and you can't get away from the sprays, if you know that you and your dog are becoming toxic, you have a right to detox and you can do that all on your own. So when it comes to vaccines, Dr. Ron Schultz said, there are few to no scientific studies demonstrating a dog or cat that needs to immunologically be revaccinated. This is Rodney's kitty. And Rodney, um, he's a Maine Coon, obviously all black and brown after that cat's FCV, after the cat's kitty shot, the kitty turned white. Um, X marks the spot of the vaccine reaction. And what did his vet, I, I can't, what did his vet tell him? Oh, it's a birthmark that came up. <laughs> Embarrassed for her, appalled for my profession. Mostly sad for him, sad for him. So what do we know about rabies vaccines? The markup is up to 6,200%. One dose of rabies vaccine, 65 cents. Average veterinarian in Chicago charges $55. There's a one-year and three-year rabies vaccine. They're the, exact same, they're the exact same product. Dr. Ron Schultz um, and Gene Dodds are working on a rabies challenge fund to study seven-year. And once we get the seven-year done, I am voting for a lifetime rabies vaccine because we know it lasts that long. I started doing wildlife rehab when I was 13. I knew I would be a wildlife veterinarian my whole life. They said, you have to get vaccinated for rabies. I received two doses of rabies vaccine myself when I was 13. When I went to vet school, all veterinarians have to be vaccinated for rabies. When I went to vet school, they said to me, oh, you were previously vaccinated? We're not gonna give you more because it could harm you. We're gonna titer you. How awesome they extended that to me, right? We don't extend that courtesy to dogs. Oh, no, it probably wears off at nine and a half months. But they were kind enough. They titered me. Thank God I didn't need more. A protective human titer and dog titer is anything greater than level five. I was vaccinated at 13, went to vet school at 23, and my titer for rabies was 2,500. I've never had a booster. I'm never going to get a booster. I'm toxic with rabies, and I'm not going to give my body more. If we could just do that for dogs worldwide, we would be healthier. So what we know to be true is the average veterinarian in the United States would lose 30% of the income in hell or high water. They do not want to reduce rabies vaccines. This is one example of Dr. Thompson saying veterinarians in their heart, they want to do what's right. But if you are lo looking at losing 30% of your practice revenue, it comes down to ethically rearranging your philosophy and being honest with your clients, which unfortunately in the United States isn't necessarily happening. So what I will tell you is if you have the luxury of dealing with a beautiful holistic vet here, that's awesome, wonderful. If you don't, you're going to have to have some potentially painful conversations with your vet that involve you saying something like this. I own and I am in charge of my dog's health and I'm electing to pay you to partner with me. 
I will be in charge of making the decisions, and I want you to honor my decisions. You may not agree with how I feed. You may have reservations about me choosing a titer, or I'm choosing to not take an automatic dewormer, and I appreciate you, and thank you for telling me your concerns. I'm not going to do what you're telling me to, and I want to make sure that we can still have a relationship where I'm in charge. If your vet is a control freak, they will say no, and you will move along. Most of the time, Nick is right, most of the time veterinarians want to help you. They just don't know what you're talking about, and you can actually help them evolve. So just hang in there. Just hang in there. So how do dogs get sick? How does the body break? Honestly, guys, most of the time, it's chronic. We know with ACL tears, unless your dog is hit by a Mack truck, your dog just does not spontaneously tear an ACL ever. In 2012, I started Therapaw Rehabilitation and Pain Management Center because I saw so many dogs. I became a physical therapist for dogs. I saw so many animals that needed PT. We know that ACLs don't rupture. They just don't, unless, you have, unless you're hit by a Mack truck or you have a nutrient deficiency. We know that even though it feels like that hemangiosarcoma that just ruptured and your dog bled out this morning, I have clients say to me, my dog just got cancer and it, this acute crisis hit this morning and you feel like you've been hit by a Mack truck. It's like, what? I'm gonna assume a low wide base. What just happened to my dog that bled out and died this morning in 30 seconds feels overwhelming. That dog was brewing cancer for probably 24 months before crisis occurred. And that's shocking. You don't, your dog just doesn't wake up a week from Wednesday, Tuesday morning and become hypothyroid. But because veterinarians aren't trained to practice clinical pathology, where we should be telling you, like at my practice, hey, your dog's four, we need to check the thyroid. They live in a toxic world. They're probably at some point, probably gonna be, at least have a suboptimal thyroid. Let's start checking now. Because as we start checking, and we compare 2012 levels to 2013, 2014, and we go from four to 3.5 to three to 2.8 to two to 1.8, common sense tells you if we keep watching the thyroid levels go down, 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 I was taught in veterinary medicine, you wait until they're zero, you ring the bell and say to your clients, Ahem, your dog has hypothyroidism. Well, if we've been watching this happen for four years on blood work, what are we doing to prevent it from happening? That's proactive medicine. But we're not there yet. But you can become your dog's best advocate by asking and, su and suggesting that even if your vet doesn't get it. You can say, I have a Labrador and one out of three labs are going to become hypothyroid. I'd like to check now because I want to be able to offset it, not using synthetics. I want to be able to fix my dog thyroid before it's actually totally broken. He's going to say, what? <laughs> and you can say, I got it. I'm going to partner with other people. They don't have to be vets. There are a ton of healers in this room that aren't vets that can fix your dog's thyroid. You partner with them to get the job done. And you clue your veterinarian in. That's how we learn. Clue them in. Let them know what they're doing. So when the thyroid balances, they're like, you did that with a homeopathic? Yeah. Yeah, I did it with a homeopathic. But they need to learn. They need to see. And being patient and pulling them along the evolutionary path is part of that. Before there's fulminant changes, there are first cellular changes. First, there's dysplastic cells in the body. Weeks to months before there are metaplastic cells in the body. Weeks to months to years before there are neoplastic cells in the body. Those are cancer cells. So the body breaks over time, unless you're hit by a Mack truck. The body breaks over time. So the goal needs to be, look at the multifactorial issues that are affecting the body breaking. Look at genetics, look at food, and look at the environment, and do an assessment as to what your dog's risks are. So, I was taught in vet school that the immune system was based on two factors, the environment and genetics, and that was that. There was no link between them, but we know that that's not true. In the last 15 years, we know that the food you choose to put in your dog's mouth will do one of two things. Everything you're putting in your dog's mouth, treat, water, grass, socks, everything that goes in your dog's mouth is either going to have a functional healing response or will be metabolically stressful, slash, not good. It falls into good or not good. The link between your dog's overall health in the environment and genetics is the topic of nutrigenomics related to food. Now, there's also a second category called um, epigenetics. And epigenetics is interesting too. When I went to vet school, they said, if you have a set of DNA in that dog, if you have a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, three-fourths of them will have a mitral valve prolapse, a heart issue by the time they're five. If you have a population that's going to have an 80% genetic expression, what they told us is just tell them, tell them when you see an eight-week-old calf, you tell them, sorry, probably going to have a heart condition. You know, we'll just keep listening until it happens, and then we'll track it as it progresses, and then we'll put him to sleep when it gets really bad. We know now 
that through food and wise lifestyle choices, we can change, even though the DNA's in that dog, we can, ex we can down regulate the potential of the dog expressing it by what we feed them and how that dog lives their life. And that's so exciting because instead of feeling helpless, we're now empowered to make all the changes we need to do to down regulate the potential of that dog expressing those genes that are inside of it. It's empowering and it's exciting and we're just starting to touch on that. So when it comes to immune system health, to the far side of failure, when your dog is in immune system failure, the end result is that your dog cannot even recognize abnormal cell growth. All of your bodies in this room and every single living creature has abnormal cellular replication happening right now. Two cells become four. There can be some DNA confusion. We can overproduce cells. We have neoplastic cells brewing right now in our body, but our blessed immune system and our dog's immune system, we got this. Way too many cells, squamous cells created, our thymus is going to communicate, send out helper killer cells and T cells and remove those. That's how come you and I don't have cancer right now. When that process failure, abnormal cell growth occurs, and that's failure ultimately of your dog's immune system. Now on the other side of the spectrum, we have an immune system that is not underactive, it's so overactive that it attacks itself. Halfway in between, right here is the allergic dog. Kind of halfway in between balance and hyperactive, you have the allergy dog. When your dog's immune system is so amped up and confused, you have autoimmune disease. So obviously the goal for all of us in this room for the immune system is balance. We want a functional balance response for our dogs. So when it comes to the immune system, we know that every cell of our pet's body has 10,000 oxidative hits a day. We know that there are lots of lesions that are occurring on a daily basis. We know that the gene expression occurs under the function of the DNA. We know that 70% of gene mutations are controlled based on what we eat and our environmental exposure. We know that aging and environmental factors are what causes genetic mutations. And we know that the first line of defense against cancer in every case is food. There are specific anti-mutagenic agents in fruits and vegetables. Now here's the frustration, and this is partly why when people say, I just do prey model, never veg, there are not antioxidants. There are no antioxidants in meat and bone and organs, sadly. So if you are, and I'm not telling you not to be prey model, right? We love everyone here. Everything's, you can feed no veg or produce ever, but let me tell you, you better be thinking, where is my dog getting antioxidants from? They are not. And if that's cool with you, it's cool with me. If you are like me and I want to extract the most I can from the power of food, I'm not a supplement girl by nature. I want to get as much as I can whole food, fresh food nutrition from living viable foods. You have no choice. You have no choice but to feed high antioxidant foods. And some of those, the indole 3 carbonyls like broccoli, chlorophyll and chlorophyll, and we know are documented to reduce DNA damage by 90%. I'll show you that study in a minute. Now, what if you shell out money for a puppy? Those of you that do rescue, God bless you, that's awesome. That's me. We don't get to pick our DNA, right? We can do DNA tests. We can figure out what breeds are in our mutts. And we can say, okay, if we have a Doberman, we know that their cardiomyopathy could be there. Maybe not, but there are some great things we can do. We can feed more bison, the richest source of ubiquinol, ubiquinone, right? The richest source of CoQ10, which is going to dramatically nourish that heart. That bison's loaded with acetyl uh, carnitine, dramatic for the heart, loaded with carnitine, great for the heart. So we can do DNA tests on our, on our rescues. If you shell out cash for a dog, you better do your homework. And what I mean by that is 95% of pregnant humans share their toxin with their babies. And we know that that's true with dogs as well. We know that puppies are being born preloaded with toxins and toxic levels of their parents' vaccines. We know that there's unbelievable levels of toxins being born in very quote unquote healthy litters of purebred puppies in this day and age. So the take home message is this. If you're gonna shell out cash for a puppy, you better become BFFs with that breeder and ask a lot of intense, painful questions. You'll know you're asking the right questions when your breeder's like, oh, are you done, right? You keep asking questions like, what did the great, great grandma die of? How, how clean is your home? How many vaccines did the bitch have? What's the, what's the nutritional level? What are you feeding the bitch eight weeks prior to breeding? Steve Brown did a fascinating study. He studied the nutritional levels of the, of the males. The dads have dramatically healthier sperm counts if they are fed species-appropriate living food diets for eight weeks prior to conception. Brilliant. Ask those questions. 
your breeder could get sick and tired of you and push you along, and that's your opportunity to find a healthier puppy elsewhere and do that. So, how many are totally depressed right now? <laughs> it's not that bad. I'm going to help you make good choices right now. We're going to cover the three pillars of health when it comes to strategic planning. And so the road to recovery really begins with strategic planning. That's repair. So guys, everyone in this room, you probably have either had a dog die of something and you guys have regret. Or the shoulda, coulda, woulda. Um, if I think back on what I know now, I had a Roddy um, ruptured disc in her neck. Uh, and if I, I know now having a rehab facility, I can't even talk about it. I could have saved her life, right? I didn't have a rehab facility 15 years ago. And I look back on that, I'm like, dang. But the lessons that that dog taught me, having to put her to sleep, I still learn from her every day. Do I have regret? Yeah. But do I learn from that dog every day? Absolutely. And those of you that um, have puppies and you're like, I'm here because I want to do things right, you're going to make better choices because you have more knowledge. So if you're in a repair phase, which means you've got a sick animal, you can make empowered choices today to change this around. And we're going to show you some basic, easy, simple, cheap things you can do to do that. If, you have a, if you're in the restore phase, which means your dog has come out of injury, your dog has come out of disease, you just normalized, your dog had elevated kidney or liver enzymes, and you want to do things to not have that happen again, you're in a restorative phase. And those of you that have young puppies and you're thinking about prevention, that's ultimately where I want all of us to be is we've learned the hard way, and we're not going to do that again. We're all in a preventive mode. We're going to start with repair. So when it comes to nutritional repair, eliminate pro-inflammatory foods. So we know that carbohydrates, Dr. Nick just said this. I cannot stress it enough. Foods are either anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory. You can Google anti-inflammatory diet for people, right? Eliminate refined sugars and carbs from your dog's diet. No corn, no wheat, no rice, no potato. If you're a foodie like me, I would prefer to not do supplements. There are some amazing whole functional food, superfoods that you can add into your dog's diet. Glycine, which comes from skin and bone, is necessary for glutathione production. Um, and that actually helps with heavy metals and PBA elimination. Turmeric actually detoxes both phase one and phase two of the cytochrome P450 pathways, both pathways. Ronnie did a great blog on turmeric. I think it went crazy viral because people were like, oh my gosh, dramatic improvement. I had a veterinarian email me last week and said, listen, I've had a dog with elevated liver enzymes for six months. I put that dog on turmeric, and two weeks later, I checked ALT. Can it really, can it really normalize the dog's liver enzymes in two weeks? Yeah, it can. Yeah, it can. And it's a functional food. It's not a supplement. Green tea contains epigallocatechin gallic catechins that inactivate carcinogens, cancer-causing agents. Dandelion, um, and, and as a herb that grows in your yard. Like in, in the States, we put pesticides out to kill dandelion. It's a medicinal food. So if you have an unsprayed yard, let your dogs eat them. You get a free detoxifier. It's wonderful. You have some dogs that will not eat functional foods, period. You have a finicky dog, you can supplement. Phase one, liver detoxification. You can use glutathione. Phase two, which is conjugation, you can use N-acetylcysteine, taurine, milk thistle, and acetylmethionine, also called SAMI. And most certainly, you can use chelation, like chlorella, or spirulina. Actually, spirulina falls under super green food, but it can come in a little tablet form, a capsule, and people think, oh my gosh, it's a pill. It's a functional food that can radically reduce the level of heavy metals in your dogs. When it comes to the immune system, you can provide homeopathic detoxification. If your dog has had the combination booster shot, distemper, adenovirus, parainfluenza, the most common homeopathic detox is Thuya. Um, and if your dog has had rabies vaccination, the most common detoxification for that is a homeopathic remedy called Listen. If your dog has suffered trauma, if you have a dog that has fallen down the stairs, if you have a dog that honest to God has been hit by a car, if you have a dog who's pulled his entire life on his chain, you can do things to undo the blessed, oh, he's eight, he's a senior, he's going to get arthritis, oh, he just got arthritis, oh, he's crippled, oh, he needs anti-inflammatory anti drugs. You can undo that now through maintenance, chiropractic, acupuncture, massage. If you have a dog that isn't bearing weight, visit a, it's worth you packing up and driving three hours to your closest rehab facility to get an evaluation, to get a protocol that gets your dog straightened out. It's worth doing that. People um, that are trained in rehab can give you functional exercises to help your dog use his body balanced. 
They can build muscle in dogs that have not enough muscle tone. We can help you with lifestyle changes that will reduce the likelihood of your dogs aging prematurely through physically caring for the frame. When it comes to restoring a dog nutritionally, you can obviously feed a species appropriate diet. You need to do everything you can to chase phytonutrients, phytonutrients and antioxidants coming from fruit and veg. You need to incorporate functional foods like the list I just gave you. You need to focus on nutrigenomics. If you guys have breeds that have breed predispositions and almost, breed, almost every breed has a breed predisposition, read Dr. Jean Dodd's book, read it, because she's gonna give you functional food suggestions. The example I'm gonna give you is I'm BRCA positive. I have the gene for breast cancer. Am I gonna do an Angelina and have my boobs removed? No. She amputated her boobs because she has the gene for breast cancer. Holy crazy, holy crazy. Now, some people in here wear glasses and some people have bad knees and some people have bad hearts. I have the DNA to have breast cancer. Will I ever go on the pill? I'm estrogen dominant. Will I ever take estrogen? No. Would I ever eat soy, which is estrogen dominant? Never. I'm incorporating really nutrigenomics to help downregulate my potential of expressing DNA that my grandma died of and all my aunts died of. It's not going to happen to me because I'm living a life that is allowing my genetic, my genetic potential to stay in the box for the rest of my life. And we can do that with dogs, but you need to know what your breed predispositions are. So if you have a mutt, do the DNA test and figure out what they are because you can add functional foods. And Gene Dodds wrote a whole book on how you pick them for each specific case. Read that book and start adding those specific foods in for your dog's weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. The key isn't to panic. The key is to find functional foods that accommodate your dog's specific weakness. The frame, you can add specific organ support. You can add in chondral protective agents. So you have a dog that did tear her ACL. You can add in perna muscle, green lip muscle. You can add in glucosamine, chondroitin. You can add in Asia memory. You can do a functional group of foods that will help grow back. When I went to vet school, they said you can't grow back cartilage. Actually, we know that you can. The slowest growing cell in the body is a chondrocyte, a cartilage producing cell. It takes six months. We now know at the slightest tear, the minute I see a dog start limping and they have a minor pain on drawer, we put that dog on chondral protective agents, the fancy word for joint support, so that that dog doesn't actually go from a partial tear to a complete tear. We're proactively managing those dogs. You can strengthen weak muscles. And for those of you that have spayed and neutered your dog, you can control estrogen. I'm not going to cry and I'm not going to go knee deep in my epic fail as a veterinarian, epic fail as a veterinarian to my clients after I just got done telling you I'm proactive and the majority of my clients have modified the vaccine schedule, the majority of my clients feed fresh, living, organic foods. Hmm. And I have um, damaged the majority of my clients, pets, through my erroneous viewpoint coming out of a kill shelter, I equated responsibility with de-sexing. And if you came to natural pet in 1999 with an intact dog at six months of age, I would say, we will de-sex them now. We will spay and neuter them right now because I don't trust you to not make a mistake with your dog. I am not, well, I, will, I will not be an abortioner. And I will not have an unwanted litter in my practice. I can't bear the thought of you having the intact pet. I put to sleep thousands of dogs at the shelter. I'm not doing it again as a veterinarian. I'm not doing it. You will de-sex your dog. And they did. <laughs> and six years later, my 15,000 dog patients came back to me very sick. And I had to get on my knees and ask for a lot of forgiveness. Because out of my ignorance, I did not know that I would cause permanent endocrine damage to every single dog that I desexed. I did not know that. And I did. So from 2006 and to this day at my practice, I am doing damage control from me not knowing that you could sterilize a dog, you can make them never reproduce and leave their ovaries for a functional hormone response. I did not know that. I know it now. I no longer spay and neuter traditionally. I have a video online. If you've never heard of this before and you want that done, I have a video that shows veterinarians how to do it step by step. I started having dogs coming in that looked hypothyroid. 
They were all fat. They were on amazing fresh food. They ate enough omega-3s four to five times a week. They were getting krill oil. They're beautiful. Fat, hair falling out, lazy, depressed, hot flashing. My male dogs that came in, I started doing uh, adrenal testing. They had the level of circulating estrogen of a cycling female because I neutered them. So I do things like add dianinol methane, DIM. I feed foods. I suggest foods that have, have high levels of DIM. Broccoli is such a great one because you get DIM and you get indole 3 carbonyl. It's anti-cancer and estrogen binding. Nice little bonus, right? People say, I don't want to feed my dog broccoli. Okay, you can get dianinol methane in supplement form, but you can do things to manage the damage that's been done. You can do that. When it comes to prevention, it gets exciting because when it comes to nutrient prevention, guys, some of you are gonna say, listen, I, everything sounds cool, I'm with you. I can't feed myself organic, I can't afford organic for myself. I get it. I couldn't either. Um, I, I fed my dog, I came in from a very productive family, but guys, I grew up fairly poor in Iowa. And when I took my Roddy to vet school, um, when the vet school said, I'll give you free food, I'm like, I'll take it. Now, I gave her veggies. I supplemented, but I primarily fed her, I almost said it, science, science. I fed her the largest commercially available pet food that they woo us with in vet school to try and get us to become distributors as veterinarians. I fed her that. She got a toxicosis, toxic went into liver failure, almost died. I brought her out of that through begging on my knees to the good Lord that if I brought my dog out of this, I would never sell commercial kibble ever, ever, ever from those top veterinary manufacturers. She came out of it. She went on fresh food and obviously it has never it's changed my life forever. I knew the power of fresh food, I just couldn't afford it. So what did I do? I ran my dog every day, and the people around me, I met farmers, I met people that were too busy, I met supermarket owners, I met the local people at my farmer's market, I said, I will, walk, I will babysit your dog if you will swap produce. If you guys are broken, can't afford organic, get creative. Start a patio garden, barter with your neighbor, meet, go visit your local farmer's markets, get really creative on just how much organic you can afford to buy being super creative, but make those connections. Move to minimally processed foods as much as you can. If you can't, guys, if you guys can only buy supermarket meat and veg, soak it in your sink with a bunch of water and some food grade hydrogen peroxide to get the chemicals off of your conventionally grown fruits and vegetables. If you can afford to buy happy, healthy meat, do it because the antibiotics, cortisol, stress hormones, toxins are m m significantly minimize by doing that. Filter your water, add antioxidants. Pregnant mice study shows that you giving a little bit of broccoli, crucifers, reduces the incidence not only of leukemia and lymphoma, but reduces carcinogenic exposure forming tumors by 96%, the power of whole food. We know that extended length between tumor times decreased by 200% uh, by just adding functional foods. When it comes to the immune system, you need to control inflammation, which means if your pet has injury or any kind of itis, make it your sole focus desire to reduce it. You can do that by adding marine sources of essential fatty acids or feed more sardines packed in water. If you guys are freaked out about feeding fish, you can do small fish that don't live very long, they don't bioaccumulate heavy metals, or feed a heavy metal free omega-3 fatty acid coming from the ocean. You can add proteolytic enzymes like Wobenzyme to naturally control inflammation. It works as well as the etagesic or Prevacox or any other N said that it, my conventional colleagues would be prescribing, it works equally as well. It's Germany's most prescribed natural anti-inflammatory, Wobenzyme. Beautiful for dogs. You can titer in place of automatically accepting your veterinarian's recommendation for more, more, more vaccines. You can minimize the chemicals in and on your pets by making natural choices. And you can ask your veterinarian, if you rescue a dog and they say you will spay that dog at six months, you can go to the head of the rescue and say, listen, I will sterilize my dog at six months and I'll get a letter, but I would prefer to do a technique that will not damage her endocrinology for the rest of her life. And sometimes they will do it and sometimes they don't. And if they don't, you do damage control. You pick up the pieces wherever they are. When it comes to the frame, when it comes to the frame and the internal organs function, you need to be checking what's happening on the inside of your dog's body. Some people say, oh, you know, I don't ever do blood work and check kidney and liver function, I'm holistic. That's not being holistic, that's being reactive. People say, my dog looks really good. Do you know how many dogs I put to sleep that look stellar on the outside, but are dying on the inside? I wanna talk about it. How do you know what's happening on the inside? We check. Do blood work. 
every year and make sure that you know in your heart of heart your dog's internal organs are as beautiful as you think that they are. Maintain your dog's weight and muscle tone. We know the most common type of malnutrition in humans, guys, is obesity. And we know by restricting calories, by you maintaining your dog's body weight, you can add up to two years to their life, just keeping them lean. It's hard for us. I tell people all the time, self-control mucks up us. You know, honestly, I'm such a foodie. I'm always like, put, put, put the food, I mean, put, you know, put, put the fork down. I just love food. Humans love food. I get it. It's a whole different issue because self-control mucks everything up. However, guys, every animal in your home is directly under your control. And there is no excuse, especially if you're feeding a raw organic diet, you know how much money you're putting into that food? No excuse for a fat dog. I mean, none. Don't let your animals become fat. And if they are, get them down into their ideal body weight. So here are my closing thoughts. Number one, despite the fact that we are holistic veterinarians, I have never been more criticized by my peers than I am by my holistic colleagues. It's devastating to me. I have never been more involved with a group of people that love their dogs no more. And I have never seen groups of people fight like I have seen in the fresh food community. I'm mortified, I'm disheartened, I'm sad. We don't play well together. And I don't see a reason for that. And I want to empower you to take a deep breath and be kind to yourself, but then to those around you. You will have viewpoints and ideas that you don't agree with. I want you to take a deep breath and realize they're at that point. Think about your evolution, guys. You remember what you thought 10 years ago or five years ago? It's not who you are now. Let yourself off the hook, but those people that are there, be kind to them as well. Learn to forgive each other. Wherever you are with your animal's health, make a plan. You may have a dog with cancer and it sucks. You may, this just happened to me on Friday. My client's husband took the dog to the vet for a nail trim came back and said, honey, they took the dog in back and gave it all the vaccines because they said that it was due. And the wife was like, yeah. She called me and says, do I file for divorce? No. <laughs> you don't file for divorce. You make a plan where you are. So we're going to detox the dog, right? We're going to get the heavy metals out of the dog. Learn to avoid regret to the best of your ability by making the best choices you can now. Apply all the knowledge you have to the animals in your care right now. Obviously, a part of that is learning and growing, learning and growing. We're going to be back here in May doing more seminars. We're going to learn and grow and apply and learn and grow and apply. Be a light to those around you when people ask super dumb questions. Remember where you were 10 years ago, 20 years ago? When people ask you things, they're like, are you kidding me? Be kind, answer their questions, help them, be a light. And most importantly, guys, enjoy the journey. Our dogs, I want you guys to close. I'm going to close on this thought. Our dogs get up every day, love us unconditionally, belch, fart, yawn, stretch, want to hang out with you. We're gone 10 to 12 hours a day. And guess what? When they come home, they're like, oh my gosh, you're home. I'm so fired up, right? The only animals in the world that love us like that, that's reason enough, regardless of what's going on in your dog's body, that's reason enough for you to smile, be happy, and enjoy this journey. They're role modeling to you unbelievable gifts. And I want you to stop, take a moment, think about that, appreciate it, kind of wallow in it, and get up tomorrow recognizing wherever you are, those little gifts, our job is to be empowered enough to make better decisions, but don't miss the moment with that blessed gift. Guys, it was a great, great to be here. I appreciate all of you, each and every one of you. It's an honor for me to be a part of this group. You guys are on the leading edge of thought. You're on the leading edge of change. We have the ability to do amazing things together if we can get along, be kind, and apply what we've learned. We'll be back in May to do it again, guys. Thank you so much.